Good evening, this is Dr. Lewis Foley, one of the exam pro faculty, and I want to welcome you to our oral board prep webinar for Tuesday, October 18th, 2022. Uh, tonight will be a caseless defense type of webinar, and I'm going to go ahead and get us started. First, just reviewing the GoToWebinar software control panel, which I believe most of you are familiar with by now, but the little orange box with a white arrow allows you to collapse or expand the control panel so you can get it out of your view during the webinar. The upper portion of the control panel determines how you will participate from an audio standpoint. And this is very important because if you're in an area with a lot of background noise or you prefer to use a telephone for your audio, you can do that by clicking audio setup, use telephone, you'll be given a number to dial in, an access code and an audio pin number. You must uh, enter the audio pin number. If you don't do this last step, I will not be able to uh, enable you to be in the hot seat. So that is very important. The bottom portion of the control panel we do not use. So please don't type any questions in here. I will not know that you have done this. We use the raise a hand feature. So if you're volunteering to participate in the webinar, you will click the raise a hand feature. I do wanna mention that all of our webinars are recorded. So if you need access to a recorded webinar session, you can contact the exam pro staff for help with that. And with that said, we are gonna get into caseless defense practice. So let me go ahead and get the case lists and we will begin uh, just one second. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna be looking for volunteers. I will also be cross-referencing our database, trying to make sure that we give as many people a chance as possible. So if you are interested, if you will click the raise a hand feature and I will get our first person into the hot seat. Dr. Herman, can I come to you first? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. And give me just one second. Let me get to your case list. If I, went, if I go by your case list, call it out to me. I apologize, I didn't. Um, it should be under October, H-E-R-R. -R. Yeah, this is October, so let me keep scrolling and let's, oh, there we go, perfect. Which list do you want me to look at? Um, Any of them should be fine, maybe Office or OB. I've kind of reviewed those so okay, far. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll start with Office then, how about that? Okay. Just one second. Let's talk about case number 17. Okay. This was interesting. So um, tell me how the patient presented. Um, so the patient presented after um, going on vacation, I believe somewhere in the Caribbean, um, with a large painful ulcer in the vulvar area. Now, you, you mentioned um, concern for chancroid. What was it that gave you concern for chancroid? Um, so it was, like I said, it was just a single um, kind of large ulcerated, very painful lesion. Um, and then, you know, with it being painful, that sort of limited the diagnosis a little bit. It didn't look like your typical herpes lesion, you know, which generally seems to present with multiple vesicular lesions. Um, she also had a um, pretty tender enlarged um, groin, like lymph node as well. Um, so, you know, I, I did a full STI workup as um, in, at least in our country, chancroid is usually a diagnosis of exclusion um, with sort of everything else that I looked into being negative. What test did you do? 
Um, so I did a HSV um, PCR off of the um, actual lesion. Um, we also did um, like a complete panel of STI blood work um, looking for syphilis, HSV, antibodies, um, and then just given the fact that we had concern for one STI, we also um, tested for things like hepatitis, syphilis, um, and as well as did um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, so a complete panel. So was there um, a, an actual diagnostic confirmation or was it truly a, a diagnosis of exclusion? Um, it was a diagnosis of exclusion. I believe uh, our lab wasn't able to test for the, I believe it's a nucleic acid test for chancroid. And it, um, in the US, at least based on the CDC recommendations, it's not a very accurate test here. Um, so it's not necessarily recommended to do. How'd you decide on the treatment? Did you decide on that or did your consultant help you with that? Um, so I had initially started the patient on azithromycin, which is one of the first line treatment um, recommended by the CDC. Um, the patient had some improvement, but not that much. So that was when I reached out to our uh, gynecologic infectious disease doctor who recommended adding on ciprofloxacin as well. Um, and then the patient eventually had resolution of her symptoms. Now, are there um, any long-term sequela or is this something that you expect to complete cure? Um, I believe that this one in particular has a is a complete cure. All right, I I can't think of anything else to ask you about this. It's very unusual to see chancroid okay. on a case list. Um, all the answers that you gave me are what I was anticipating. Uh, another treatment option would be erythromycin, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, and but again. Um, the the key here is ruling everything else out for in most cases for us um let me ask you i'm going to ask you a different question from the same case because that that didn't use up very much of your time and i want to give you a few more minutes to talk about something to kind of practice for the exam let me ask you this um if this patient had and this is kind of a more of a bread and butter straightforward kind of thing that we run into all the time if this patient had ended up testing positive for HSV. Uh, granted, her scenario isn't exactly the perfect story, but let's assume that her scenario was a little more possible HSV and she tested positive for HSV. What would you have told her if this was a new diagnosis of HSV? Um, so, you know, I would talk to her about um, treatment for um, a primary infection. Um, I would also talk about some expectations of recurrent um, infections in the future, um, ways in which both recurrent infections can be treated as well as indications for suppressive therapy. Um, we would also talk about, you know, um, preventing spread to any partners. Um, we'll tell her about that. And, um, so, you know, we would talk about that oftentimes herpes actually is um, contagious before you're going to have any actual visual lesions and people oftentimes will have some sort of prodromal symptom, whether it's like a little bit of pain, tingling, something along those lines and to treat that as, you know, um, the start of symptoms and to start being to take your suppressive therapy. It's also if you have a serodiscordant couple, um, the patient can just take suppressive therapy, even if they don't have recurrent um, herpes uh, outbreaks, just to decrease the risk of passing it along to the patient or to the partner. Is it possible for a person with herpes to transmit it to a partner when they are not having a prodrome or any lesions? Um, I would imagine that it is. I don't know what the, like, what the percentage risk factor of that would be. What is the risk if this patient were to get, if a patient with herpes were to get pregnant and uh, have a recurrence at the time of delivery? What is the risk for vertical transmission? Um, that risk is high, um, especially in the setting of a vaginal delivery with an outbreak at delivery. So we would recommend a cesarean section. Any idea on the percentage? Um, if I would have to guess, I, I would guess it's probably above 20% since we are recommend we do recommend C-section for it, but I, I'm not positive on that number. 
Okay, good. So the discussion, um, I think a couple key points that I just want to hit on. Asymptomatic viral shedding, which is that situation where there is transmission in the absence of prodrome or lesions. This is a very important point that the examiners will be listening if you're in a discussion of herpes to make sure and mention that. Um, although it's much more likely to transmit the infection during prodrome or an outbreak, uh, it certainly can happen uh, during uh, times where there are no symptoms. Um, when we think about vertical transmission, uh, it all depends on whether it's a patient who's having a recurrence or a patient who's having a primary outbreak. The reason that we do this C-section is because the tra vertical transmission mainly occurs by direct contact with virus uh, in the birth canal. But with a recurrent infection where the patient already has had a robust immune response, um, there's going to be a lot less virus present and there's also going to be some antibodies uh, present uh, in the circulation. So the risk of vertical transmission with a recurrent outbreak at the time of delivery is about 3%. But if it's a primary outbreak, the risk is about 50%. So it's a much different scenario, primary versus recurrence. Um, I didn't ask you, but I will now. If a patient has a recurrence on the buttocks at the time of labor, would you let them have a vaginal delivery? Yes. And how would you handle that? Um, I have seen it done before where they've covered those lesions actually with tegaderms um, just to prevent any spread and then just making sure to counsel the patient as well as everyone taking care of the patient not to touch that area. Um, you know, and, and I'm assuming when you say on the buttocks that it's like kind of on the posterior end, it's not like, you know, favoring towards the vulva or anything like that. Yeah, and the other thing to mention if you get a question like a structured case in the exam like this is that you would do a detailed exam, including an internal like sterile speculum exam, just looking for any, any lesions uh, on the cervix or in the vagina. Um, and of course, if, if, there are, if there are no lesions, then you could cover those ones that are remote from the birth canal and proceed with a vaginal delivery. All right, good. Any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? Um, no, I mean, I kind of like referenced the CDC a couple times when I was talking about the chancroid. Is that something? Uh, I that think that's totally legit. Yeah. <laughs> because what that shows is that this was something outside of your experience and you consulted the experts, which is what they expect you to do. Um, but you knew all of the different pieces of the management and you were able to talk about them. And that's, I think I would do exactly the same thing that you just did in the actual exam. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. But let me just go back to my sheet here and we'll get the next person in the hot seat. Dr. Skuzapaka, and I'm sure I screwed that up. I apologize. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How do you say your last name? It's Shupak. <laughs> Shupak, oh, that's easy. Okay, all right. Um, so can I go to you next? Uh, yes. I saw my name, it was above, you passed it. Thank you, oh yeah, right there, okay. Uh, which list would you like to work from? I have a case on GYN um, that I've never discussed that had a complication that I'd like sure. to discuss. Which one is it? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number. It's down towards the bottom. Um, I, can, I have, let me I'll see. I'll keep scrolling until we find it here. Yeah. Column. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Just look at the complications column. Yeah, that's um, okay. It's number ninety-four. All right. Okay, so let's see here. Oh, 
Ah, okay, all right. Um, okay, I'm going to ask you several different questions. My first question is, you mentioned in the prep column suspected intrauterine adhesion. How, how was that uh, suspicion developed? Why, why did you suspect that? This patient um, had come to see me because she has a history of infertility. And as part of our typical workup, we evaluate the uterine cavity. And so part of this workup um, is a saline infused sauna histogram, at which time um, I saw multiple filling defects throughout the fundal and corneal region of the uterus. And so what was your presumptive or preoperative assessment on why the patient had this problem? She did have a history of a DNC uh, for a previous miscarriage, and so I did review the operative report, and I saw that they utilized a sharp curette. Okay, and um, is that unusual to utilize a sharp curette uh, when uh, performing a DNC for an early pregnancy loss? No, I think that that is pretty routinely used um, for that indication. Okay, so are you proposing though that as well? Actually, did she also have amenorrhea long-standing, or was that a new complaint? No, this was a new complaint um, that she came to see me okay. with. Okay, so were you proposing that the DNC resulted in Asherman's, and that's what the intrauterine adhesions were from? That's correct. So tell me about the hysteroscopy. Was it difficult? No. Um, so I started the hysteroscopy, I evaluated her uterine cavity. I had no difficult with distension um, at a low pressure of 75 millimeters mercury. I, upon entering, um, I was at the level of the internal os and I was unable to see both ostea um, due to obstruction with uh, dense adhesions anterior to posterior towards the right corneal region and additionally in the fundus. Um, I subsequently began lysing adhesions um, using a myo -sure at first. However, due to the angle, I had to switch to scissors, um, hysteroscopic scissors to lyse the adhesions that way. Okay, and uh, during the lysis of adhesions, was there ever a point where you became disoriented or were concerned about a perforation of the uterus? No, there wasn't. Um, and typically, you know, if I'm concerned, uh, the things that I do are evaluate my fluid deficit to see if there's a sudden increase in deficit, um, you know, see if there's a loss of distension, any bleeding. But the scar tissue was avascular and I did not have bleeding. And so at the time of the hysteroscopy, I did not suspect that I had a uterine perforation and it did not, um, wasn't on my radar or so to speak at the time. What was your fluid deficit? My fluid deficit for this one was 1,200. Is that a normal fluid deficit for you? Yes, for when I'm doing an extensive lysis of adhesions, um, typically they're slower cases as I tend to be very careful with my scissors. So at the conclusion of the lysis of adhesions, were you able to visualize the entire uterine cavity? Yes, I was able to visualize the cavity and I was able to see both ostea in the same view from the internal os, um, and I had reached the um, vascularized tissue. I had a mild amount of bleeding at the fundus, but for me, that's pretty normal once I reach um, endometrium and I've finished lysing the adhesions. When did the patient start to behave unusually, or when did the problem first present itself, I guess is a better way of asking that. So she was discharged home, um, and then at around 8 p.m. I got a page um, and I spoke directly to her on the phone. She was reporting abdominal pain, some nausea and vomiting. And so I did not feel comfortable with, you know, that level of pain after hysteroscopy. So I instructed her to return to the ER where I saw her. Um, At that moment, when you instructed her to go to the ER, what was the differential diagnosis that you were considering in your mind? I was concerned that she could have a uterine perforation. Um, I was also thinking maybe she has fluid from the hysteroscopy if she had extravasation from the fallopian tubes into her abdomen. Um, those are the primary two things on my differential at this time. So you had her go to the ER. Did you um, do anything else? Did you leave the evaluation up to them or did you initiate the evaluation yourself? 
No, I went to the ER and was there when she arrived. Um, I had them get vitals and a stat CBC, um, and I did a focused abdominal exam where I was able to, she had a rigid abdomen, I elicited peritoneal signs, she had rebound tenderness. Um, her vitals were pretty stable. Um, she had tachycardia about 100, um, and I looked back at her vitals and she, her baseline was about 70 to 80, so it was increased from her baseline. Um, so at this point, I was pretty concerned even before I got the CBC back that um, she had some kind of fluid in her abdomen. Okay, so when you got the CBC back, there was a notable decrease from your pre-op? I don't routinely get a pre-op CBC um, for hysteroscopies. However, I did have one um, in her chart that her PCP had done two months prior and her baseline was about 12 and it was nine at this time. Okay, now I wanna stop for a second and I wanna just point out an exam technique thing that you just did. I was not expecting that you would have done a CBC. So it was very nice the way that you've obviously done your homework about this case. And I like the way that you presented, you could have just said her pre-op CBC was, I think you said 12, right? But, but you didn't. Instead, you gave me the context in which that information was acquired. And I think that's very nice. Let's continue, though. So here you are in the ER. She's got an acute abdomen. She has a significant drop in her hemoglobin. Uh, so at that point in time, uh, what were your management options that you were considering? My first thing was to triage in my mind, is this patient acute and have a surgical abdomen or is she not? And so I decided at this time that the most prudent decision was to take her to the operating room for a diagnostic laparoscopy. Tell me about the laparoscopy. Was it complicated? No, um, we entered into the OR, um, we entered the abdomen and I saw that there was indeed a fundal perforation that had actually clotted off. Um, there was clot sitting in the defect. Um, so with an atraumatic grasper, I removed the clot and subsequently um, I saw a vessel begin to start pumping um, and quickly was able to identify the bleeding. Okay, so how did you deal with that? So I um, quickly put in an accessory port in the right lower quadrant and I used a V-lock uh, barb suture with a loop looped end and I did a figure of eight to close that defect and then I over sewed the serosa. And the bleeding stopped? Yes, and then at this point, um, I forgot to mention, but I did call in general surgery to assist me in running the bowel um, laparoscopically because the instrument that I most likely perforated with were my scissors and so I was not comfortable closing her until I had ran the bowel. Okay, I wanna stop you for a second. If you had not mentioned that, I would have asked you, did you do anything else? And so for everybody listening, um, you know, if you have a case with a complication, there are gonna be some minimal things, depending on what case we're talking about, that absolutely have to be mentioned. And in a case like this, we don't really know when the perforation occurred. It could have been dilating the uterus. Um, doesn't sound like it was. Could have been the scissors, could have been the myasher. Since we have no idea and the patient came in with a significant complication, if you did not mention running the bowel, it would absolutely make this case a negative for your uh, sort of performance as far as whether you're pass, fail, or borderline. This would be very bad if you didn't mention it. So I'm glad you did. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's something you did yourself, fine. If it's something you, which for most of us laparoscopically, we're not that comfortable running the bowel, so Meta had to do an open case if that was the situation, but somebody needs to evaluate for a possible unrecognized bowel injury and uh, having general surgery come in is completely appropriate. So tell me about this. Uh, describe how you run the bowel. So typically you start at the ligament of trites um, and you subsequently go through the bowel until the terminal ileum. And then at that time, you are in the large intestine and you make sure to evaluate the length of the large intestine as well, looking for any serosal defects or full thickness defects. Did you guys find anything? 
No, we did not. Thankfully. Okay, so then what'd you do? Um, so after that, I irrigated um, her abdomen, cleared out all the uh, blood clots with the suction irrigator, and I closed the patient. Why did she stay two nights? So at this point, one midnight had elapsed. Um, so that was the first night. And for the second day, um, when we got her post-op labs in the four hours later, her hemoglobin had dropped to eight. She felt significantly weak. Um, and so at this time, I counseled her for a blood transfusion given her symptoms. By the time we were able to get the blood transfusion, transfusion, it was already the evening and she didn't feel comfortable going home late in the evening. And I supported that decision and allowed her to stay an extra night. If you had this case to do over again, is there anything you'd do differently? Yes, I think that if I um, had extensive fundal adhesions like I did, um, you know, the first thing I would have done is called for the ultrasound machine and I would have done it under ultrasound guidance using one of the assistants in the room um, so that I could adequately visualize where I was in relation to the fundus. All right. Uh, it's obvious to me, even though you said you have not um, talked about this case, I think you prepared for it yourself talk to yourself about it. Oh. And um, yeah. I, I don't know if we're gonna go through the whole discussion, but I kind of started at the beginning just to kind of get a sense for where there might be any potential weaknesses. I'm very comfortable with the way you discussed this case. I think probably the hardest part about this case is the fact that whenever we have a bad outcome, we always, it always bothers most good surgeons. We don't wanna have complications. We, you know, kind of blame ourselves. But truthfully, surgery is difficult and it's not without risk. And that's why we have to think about every, every case we do to be uh, thorough and detail oriented. And when a patient doesn't do the way that we expect them to do, like you said, you talked to her on the phone and it did not sound appropriate. That was a very important point that you made. It didn't sound appropriate for post hysteroscopy. Uh, mm -hmm. So you brought her in. Um, I don't have any problem with, I think the examiners will look at this as uh, not a, um, it's not a uh, mark against you as a surgeon. In fact, the way you handled it is really very positive. Um, you know, the best that you could expect. So I don't know if you have any questions for me, but I, I'm very, I'm very comfortable with it. I think my biggest issue is that I didn't recognize it at the time of the surgery. And so I, I didn't really know how to discuss that, that I didn't have a suspicion at all. And so but I, I just told you exactly what happened and I guess that was good enough. Well, you know what? I mean, the thing is most complications sneak up on us. You know, right. so I mean, even I'm, I'm sure that it wasn't a lack of appreciation for the, the risk or the possibility you were doing dissection of dense adhesions. Um, right. you know, so, I mean, I'm sure it was a tough case. I really listening to you get the feeling that the case went smoothly and that there wasn't any sign that you could have necessarily recognized. Um, although obviously the injury occurred during your surgery. And so, you know, it's, it's not, the best thing is that you took accountability for what happened and did what needed to be done. Um, and I also like the fact that when I asked you, cause I think it's an important question, whenever you have a complication, if you had this case to do over again, would you do anything differently? And what that question is really about is we're allowed to learn as we go. If there's a better way, then next time we should do it the better way. And it's not always true. Sometimes we have complications and we did everything exactly the way we would do it again. But the suggestion to use ultrasound in a difficult case, especially because the quality of ultrasound is so much better today than it was 20 or 30 years ago, um, it's, a, it's a good suggestion. Okay, all right. Okay, Thank you. yeah, you're yeah. welcome. Good job. Let me go to my list and we will get our next person in the hot seat.
Dr. Eggers, are you there? Yeah. Okay, if I come to you next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, which list do you want me to pull up? Um, you can do either GYN or Office. All right, um, I'll see what, let's do GYN. Okay, let's talk about case number 20 for just a second. So, okay. how likely is it that a patient will have urinary retention following a sling procedure? I counsel my patients that there's about a 20% chance that they'll um, have acute retention and go home with a Foley catheter. So with this in mind, um, do you do any preoperative preparation in case the patient has retention? Um, we have an extensive counseling um, session preoperatively where we talk about the active voiding trial process that we do, um, what they could expect, you know, sort of the success and failure rates. Um, we give them a um, handout actually on catheter care, um, you know, at that visit just in case they do end up going home with a Foley catheter. Do you do any pre-op teaching for intermittent self-catheterization? Um, I do not um, because most patients are going to go home with a catheter for about two days and come back into uh, the office, repeat a voiding trial, and pass that voiding trial and be able to uh, discontinue the Foley catheter. Um, if the patients fail the repeat office voiding trial at that point we i will um discuss um intermittent catheterization with them and um offer that to them versus um you know continuing to use a fully catheter you mentioned that they'll come back in two days and they'll do a voiding trial in the office describe that voiding trial to me certainly um so i disconnect the actual foley from the drainage bag after making sure that the Foley has fully emptied their bladder. I will then take um, sterile, sterile water and um, using a, um, a, a Tumi syringe sort of with the top pulled off, um, I will put that into the uh, Foley catheter where the collection tubing had been previously connected, hold it up as high as I can above the level of the bladder, slowly pour in about 300 milliliters of the sterile water um, until it is fully into the bladder. Then I'll you know, clamp off the, the catheter um, so that it doesn't all pour out uh, after I um, uh, release the balloon, pull out the Foley catheter, um, and then get them over to a commode or a toilet. Generally, I give patients about 15, 20 minutes to um, to attempt to void, and I'm looking for them to void about two thirds of what I put in. And do you have a patient on antibiotics when they have a Foley catheter in place uh, after surgery like this? I do not. And are there any risk factors or any um, surgical issues that might predispose a patient to having this problem? to having uh, urinary retention? Yes. Um, yeah, certainly. So in, in general, I think risk factors would include um, more advanced prolapse uh, at the time of surgery, um, longer surgery, increasing age, um, any um, pre-existing um, hypotonic detrusor or pre-existing urinary retention. Um, also, a UTI um, can increase in retention risk. What was the um, the bladder biopsy about? Uh, that's purely for a research study that we're doing as part of the fellowship. It was not um, indicated by any clinical indication just to obtain tissue for a research study. What is the research study looking at? 
Um, we are looking at um, the differences in the endocannabinoid pathway in patients that have OAB and then patients that don't have OAB to see if there's any differences in receptor expression or um, enzymatic expression at the protein and RNA level. Describe how the site for biopsy is selected and how the tissue is handled. Mm -hmm. So um, we, I, I would do a biopsy at an area that is uh, well away from the course of the ureter or the trigone. So I generally prefer um, the lateral wall and I'll choose an area that does not appear to be vascular. Before I even do a biopsy, I do a very thorough exam of the bladder to make sure that there's no lesions that need to be biopsied for clinical indications um, or other abnormalities that need to be preferentially taken care of or even injuries from the surgery. Um, once the um, biopsy is obtained, uh, it is put into a, a sterile um, tissue tube filled with a PBS solution on a telfa, and that is put on ice until it's taken to our research lab. One last question. If this patient had not improved with her Foley catheter and voiding trial, uh, what would you have done? Um, so if she had failed her repeat office voiding trial, I would have discussed um, intermittent catheterization with her and um, instructed her on, you know, voiding and then after she attempts to void to, um, to measure how much she voids if she's able to void and then immediately after that perform catheterization and measure the output because that gives me a sense of her um, post void residuals and to do this usually two, three weeks. Um, while monitoring these post void residuals because sometimes they will uh, improve over time. But if they're not improving over time and she continues to have significant retention, I would then discuss with her a uh, sling release procedure. And do you do the sling, re sling release procedure in the office or the OR? The OR or our surgery center. And if you do a sling release, would you anticipate the patient is going to become incontinent again? I counsel patients that there's about a 50% chance that they will have stress incontinence again um, with the sling release. All right, so I'm gonna stop here. And um, this is an interesting case. Uh, it's, it's The thing that's interesting about it to me is it's relatively common, something I would anticipate is gonna happen in a decent percentage of sling procedures. Mm -hmm. And so with it, with it in mind, I think the management of this particular complication has a lot to do with preoperative preparation of the patient. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that some some places, uh, at least in the past, used to teach intermittent self catheterization, especially to patients that were, uh, you know, younger and probably more likely to be able to easily do it. It's not mm -hmm. a very difficult thing, as you know, once patients learn to do it. Um, but again, that's that's not a requirement. That's just one approach. But the key here is knowing that this is a more common type of complication then there is a certain amount of preoperative preparation of the patient that that I think is helpful. Um, I like the discussion of all the different things that you told me about. Um, I want to point out the part about the bladder biopsy. Were you expecting to be asked about that? I actually wasn't. <laughs> so here's the deal. Um, whenever you are involved in a research project or you do something on your list because of a research project, mm -hmm. the examiners may ask you, they're, they may not, obviously I know nothing about your research project, and they're not going to be able to judge um, what, whether your research project is necessarily a good or a bad project. Some might, some might not, depending on their familiarity with the topic. But if you don't know the details, they'll be disappointed. OK, right. Uh, and you know, sometimes we're assisting, we're doing something for somebody else's research project. So maybe we don't know it quite as well as a project that we're one of the primary investigators for. I'm speaking to everybody listening. If you have anything about a research project on your case list anywhere and you're not the primary investigator, do make sure you understand the project, even though you might have only been randomizing a patient on labor and delivery to this versus that, or, you know, whatever the case may be. If you don't know the research project, it will look bad for you. Um, so you obviously do. I mean, I, I got the feeling you're one of the investigators doing it. Is that yeah. true? Yeah. I like it. Okay. So any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I'm actually kind of glad you asked me about that because 
now if they ask me in the real thing, I won't be like, you know, thrown off course. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think that's great. And good luck with the project. I hope it, I hope it shows something meaningful. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right, let me go back to the list and we will get our next person into the hot seat. Dr. Pollard, I'm going to come to you next if that's okay. Dr. Pollard, are you there? I think I have unmuted you, so now you just have to unmute yourself, and then I should be able to hear you. And I cannot hear you. I'm going to try muting and unmuting you just a second. Let me try that again and we'll see if that helps. Okay, how about now? I know you're volunteering because I can see your hand is raised. At least I hope that's intentional. Um, I'm looking for your list. To see if we have it here. And I'm, I'm going to have to be able to talk to you. Let me see if I can. Are you there, Dr. Pollard? All right. So I'm not sure what the problem is here. Um, it's usually something with the audio settings, like I was talking about at the beginning of the webinar. Um, there are a couple of options. Uh, one would be to check the audio settings on your computer. Um, just to make sure that you are using uh, the microphone or if you're doing the telephone, then you should be unmuted just by me clicking. The software is telling me that you are self-muted, and so there's nothing I can do beyond what I've already done. I'm going to re-mute you. I'm going to go to another person. I'm going to come back to you again in just a minute uh, so that um, hopefully we will have the problem solved. And give me just a second as I get another person in the hot seat, and then I will come back to you, Dr. Pollard, and give it another try. Dr. Santos, can I come to you next? Yes, hi. Oh, good. I'm glad you're working because if, if I couldn't get you unmuted, I was going to think the problem was on this end. Okay. Um, which case list would you like me to look at? Um, any of them are fine. I haven't finished reviewing my OB list yet, but um, I mean, any of them are fine. Okay, I'll see what we have. Do you want to look at OB since you haven't finished? Would that be helpful? Or do you want to look at something else because you're not really feeling ready? Um, for I can do my OB list. That's fine. I just have to find your, oh, there we go. Yeah. Right there. Okay, let me pull up your OB list. Let's see what we have here. Okay, wait a minute. Um, okay, let's talk about case number 18. Okay. So you made the antepartum diagnosis of a placenta accreta? Correct. How was that diagnosed? Yeah, so this was diagnosed um, at the time of anatomy ultrasound. This patient had um, good prenatal care, and so we were able to diagnose this early. 
um, in this patient, she had a history of a classical cesarean delivery and then also had a placenta previa at the time of her anatomy ultrasound. So that obviously heightened our suspicion. And then um, on abdominal ultrasound, there um, was some- No, wait a second. So she had a classical cesarean delivery. Where is the incision for a classical cesarean delivery? Um, so it's on the anterior uterine wall, um, but this this previa was kind of taking up, it, it was overlying the scar as well. Okay, all right, you see where my question's coming from, right? Because if she had a term classical, it might be through the fundus, which might not actually be in the same spot as a placenta previa. Yeah. That's why I asked that question. Okay, all right, good. So this was overlying her scar and it was Diagnosed. Do you know what any of the ultrasound findings are that are consistent with placenta accreta? Yeah, I do. So uh, looking at placenta lacuna is the most uh, specific finding, but then also thinning of the myometrium uh, is another finding, a uh, lack of the hypoechoic zone between the placenta and the myometrium, and then also a thinning of the space between the bladder and the um, myometrium as well can be another another finding. Um, and and then were, were multiple findings like this present on the ultrasound? Yeah, we saw placental lacunae and then uh, the lack of the hypoechoic zone as well as, as thinning. Yeah, there was um, no concern for involvement of the bladder extension beyond the, the uterus. Why was the MRI performed? So we performed these surgeries concurrently with our GYN oncology colleagues. They perform the hysterectomy portion and they always request the MRI just for the surgical planning on their end. Um, yeah, that was the reason. Okay. And mm -hmm. so then once uh, you had the diagnosis, uh, you were fairly confident of this diagnosis uh, yeah. early in pregnancy, right? Yes. So what did you discuss with the patient regarding delivery options? Had she been planning that this would be her only child? No, she was not planning that this would be her only child. And um, she had a really unfortunate obstetric history of having a stillbirth and then having that stillbirth be delivered through a classical cesarean. So, um, and I understood that this was a patient that probably would not I mean, this isn't good news for anyone, but this was especially bad news for her that this would be her only child. Um, but I did discuss with her the options at our institution. We prefer to perform a cesarean hysterectomy at the time of delivery between 34 weeks and 36 and six weeks. We briefly discussed that there are conservative management options for placenta accreta spectrum, but it's really not something that has been done at our institution and not something that we're comfortable with. And after the counseling, she decided to um, move forward with the plan of cesarean hysterectomy. Did you consider to possibly try to separate the placenta at the time of delivery and uh, and make the decision for hysterectomy based upon whether or not you could do that? So typically what, what I do is after delivery of um, the neonate, I will wait for a minute if um, you know if there's no bleeding to see if the placenta will separate spontaneously. But if it doesn't, then no, I don't try to remove it if I'm highly suspicious for an accreta. Why not? Because I can cause more bleeding and um, I, I can cause a hemorrhage essentially and uh, make it an emergent hysterectomy. What is the average blood loss in a placenta accreta if it's not managed uh, proactively like you guys did? Uh, that's a good question. I would be guessing. Um, I mean, I I would say probably like six or seven liters. I think it'd be very high. What is the likelihood that a patient with a placenta accreta will get a blood transfusion around the time of delivery? 50%. Yes, so let me ask you this. The You did the delivery. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll give you feedback in just a second. You did the delivery, and then uh, G1 Oncology, were they part of the delivery, or did they take over after the delivery was complete? After the delivery. And then they did a total abdominal hysterectomy? Correct. Okay. And um, 
the ureteral stents. What was mm -hmm. the purpose of that? Yeah, so that's also something that our GYN oncology team prefers to do. We place them um, prior to starting the procedure uh, just to be able to uh, make out our ureters easily during the case um, and to facilitate our dissection. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you had a 1300 cc EBL. Why? Um, Is that your average EBL for a for a cesarean section? No, no. Um, yeah. So this this is considered a postpartum hemorrhage. Um, and it was just surgical blood loss, just from the added hysterectomy to the cesarean um there was no atme or any other complications yeah. that and so that question you know i have to be honest with you that's it's not a fair question i mean i would consider this given the whole scenario it looks like everything was managed really well um one other question i do want to ask you and then I'll give you the feedback the mm -hmm. um the, you mentioned at your institution that the window for the delivery is between 34 and 36 and 6. how do you mm -hmm. decide where in that window to do the delivery? Because I noticed this patient was delivered at the very earliest part of that window. Yeah. Um, so I have a discussion with the patient. Um, typically, I'll factors that will kind of let me push the patient out further along in that window are if you know if they're nulliparous, if they don't have any risk factors for delivering earlier like if they don't have a short cervix or don't have a history of preterm delivery then um i'm more persuaded to to go further um she was very anxious and so she wanted to be delivered in the earlier part of that time frame but she she could have been pushed out all right well i'm going to just say this i think the um the the thing that caught my eye when i was first looking at it was the the placenta accreta with the previa but the classical cesarean okay yeah. so i was like oh okay that's interesting um but looking at the case on paper it looks like everything was managed exactly the way i would expect and for anybody who has accreta on their list if you didn't manage it like this the examiners will be wondering and so just a couple of things i asked i'll just mention the answers and this information is in ACOG, it, it's, um, I think it's an obstetric consensus uh, care statement that they have on Accreta Spectrum. But um, you, you, do, you, you can make the diagnosis antepartum. Um, sometimes there can be a question about whether it's a global Accreta or just a focal abnormal area. MRI is not always required, but it is quite frequently done. And um, if you believe that you have a significant global placenta accreta, then you should not try to deliver the placenta. Uh, attempt at manual separation of the placenta is usually where things go badly. Historically, 90% of patients, I think they say in the um, ACOG publication, 90% of patients would receive at least a two unit blood transfusion. And the average blood loss, I wanna say, I think they say five to seven liters. Of course, the blood volume of a woman is somewhere in that range. So it's a fairly tremendous um, um, blood loss. I think, I wanna say five liters, I think is what they say, but I can't remember that exact number. So the bottom line is that uh, placenta accreta is a very serious situation. Um, conservative management has not really ever been shown to be that successful and is associated with its own set of complications. Um, things like uh, leaving the placenta intact, uh, and I'm not even gonna go into it because I don't, I don't think it's something you would, unless you're doing some kind of research protocol, I wouldn't expect you to mention it in the exam. Um, so I think, I think that's everything I have. Do you have any questions for me? No. Uh, no, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And you actually have a couple of these cases, obviously being in your fellowship, you get the tough cases. So <laughs> yeah, nice job. Thanks. All right, let me get the next person in the hot seat here. I'm going to go back to Dr. Pollard first and see if I can unmute her. Dr. Pollard, are you there? And I still can't hear you. I have to apologize. I'm not sure what the uh, 
what the issue is there tonight. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try somebody else and just uh, keep moving here. Dr. Rodriguez, are you there? Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Can I come to you next? Yeah. Which list would you like me to look at? Um, I do have an OB case I would like to go over. I know we just did OB. Yeah, but... that's fine. That's no problem at all. Let me just uh, get your list here. Which case is it? Um, it's number 139. Now, I have to ask, tell me about your practice. <laughs> so I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and um, we're the second busiest labor and delivery in the state. Um, I'm in a private practice, but I also do hospitalist, or we act as a hospitalist whenever we're on call. So we take care of our own patients, but also any drop-in patients that we get at the hospital, or you know, patients who don't have an assigned doctor. How many calls a week do you take? Um, typically one call a week and then like one weekend a month. Okay, and is it in-house call? Yes. Okay, um, I just really, you know, obviously the reason I'm asking is looking at the numbers. Okay, so tell me about uh, about the, let's see, case 139, this is the case? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just take a look at this for a second. Now these complications are, I believe these are all uh, in the infant. Uh, the ambiguous genitalia, yes, they are in the infant. I guess what I should have- The pulmonary that, edema but... is maternal from the preeclampsia with severe features, but the ambiguous genitalia, Correct. that's the infant and the congenital adrenal hyperplasia was the, ended up being the cause that was identified. Yes. Now, was any of this known pre-delivery? No, actually this patient had had um, excellent prenatal care. Um, she did have an NIPT done early on in the pregnancy, which showed a, um, it was negative and showed a normal female um, fetus. She had a normal anatomy scan um, at 20 weeks. And at that point throughout the pregnancy, didn't have any complications. So there was no indication to do a repeat ultrasound. Okay, and so then um, at the, the situation was first recognized in the delivery room? Correct, after delivery of the fetus. Um, she was delivered um, via C-section. So um, I was alerted of it. I don't typically look at the genitals after uh, delivering the baby um, right away, but um, after the delivery, the um, NICU nurses that do a recovery um, did bring that to my attention of the ambiguous genitalia. Okay, um, what was the difficulty with the delivery? Um, so at this, my, so she, this patient had labored. Um, as you can see, she did spend a total of seven nights in the hospital. Three of those were part of her induction process. Um, and she did have an arrest of active labor at eight centimeters. Um, and um, I believe she was around um, zero station. So once she, you know, was taken back for a C-section, it was just um, the baby's head was wedged down. And once I was able to break the suction, um, my assistant at that time wasn't able to give um, appropriate pressure um, to help delivery of the fetus. And so I did have to use a vacuum um, to assist in delivery of the fetal head. And there were no complications with that? Correct. Okay, um, so regarding the CAH, what is the most common uh, cause as far as uh, enzyme deficiency? Yeah, so I believe um, it's close to almost all, like I would say um, maybe 90 to 95% of cases of congenital adrenal hyperplasia are caused to the um, 21 beta hydroxylase deficiency. And what are some of the uh, manifestations of this? 
So with this, um, because that enzyme um, is deficient, it kind of shunts the um, pathway of steroids towards um, producing more androgen. And so one of the common presentations, as is, was in this baby, was ambiguous genitalia. Um, these infants can also have um, go into shock um, after the delivery because they struggle with making cortisol or their steroid production. And they can also be seen to have um, salt wasting. And I believe this is because there's a decrease um, in aldosterone. I'd have to confirm, but I think that's what okay. causes it. Now, let me ask you um, one other thing about this. So, um, this is something that most newborn screening programs do test for. Do you know how this is inherited, and do you know what test is usually done in the newborn screening? Um, the inheritance pattern of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, I would have to look into. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and yeah, typically, I, I know that newborns are screened for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and I'd, I'd be guessing if I, okay. yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, okay, so here's the deal. So the last two questions I think are maybe harder questions you might not have thought about. Um, it is autosomal recessive, okay? And um, the newborn screening programs, that they are actually looking for is the level of 17 OHP. Uh, um, so in the in most of the newborn screening programs, so um, so they might miss uh, less severe cases uh, actually, um, and that could lead to it. Uh, you know, some of the more mild milder cases will be diagnosed later in childhood. Um, so and you gave a number of the different things that are associated with this and the salt wasting, and I do believe that is related to aldosterone, although I have not looked at that particular issue uh, recently I'm just going from memory um, what did you what did they recommend for treatment um, so they did um, start this baby initially when they were doing the workup um, they did start her on steroids um, and then once I saw the mom um, postpartum uh, during her postpartum visit I was able to kind of discuss further as far as what the treatment plan was going to be um and they had just kept her on a steady regimen of steroids um as far as her ambiguous genitalia it seemed like the under the pediatric endocrinologist that was taking care of her was confident that um she wouldn't need to have any sort of like surgery or anything like that later on in life because they were confident that once they stabilized and continued to treat her that that would all um kind of go away um, and that was the late of the last of it that I know. So do you know what they treated specifically, what medications they treated her with? Um, I'd have to look at, at it. I don't know. Okay. I, I don't, I don't think it's really a fair question because we're not pediatricians. My, my recommend, my rec recollection is that they are usually on um, hydrocortisone, but I think they're on usually more than one steroid and on uh, I want to say they get sodium chloride supplementation as well. Um, okay. I would take a look just in case okay. they ask. Okay. Yeah, I know that. Um, I don't, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I think with um, NIPT, we've become a lot less um, detail oriented on on investigating the genitalia on ultrasound. And, and perhaps, I don't know, I don't know how significant this was at the time of delivery. Do you think you would have noticed it on an ultrasound? Uh, yeah. It was pretty okay. significant. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, that's the one thing this makes me think of is that sometimes when we get information in more than one way, if we already know what we're looking for, then you know it becomes less, we become less critical in our evaluation, for instance, of ultrasound of the genitalia, maybe not spending as much time or even looking at it at all. So, um, but that has nothing to do with you. I think this this is an interesting case. Was there anything else that you were anticipating or that uh, that I didn't, you know, I didn't ask you that you were thinking I would? No, I think I'm just, the, it just makes me nervous because I don't feel as comfortable with like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And I just wasn't sure like how 
detailed I needed to go into it just because I know like pathways and all those names and all that has always been intimidating to me. So yeah. I just so that brings up if this was a written board exam, I would say that the knowing the pathway is critically important because they're gonna ask you a multiple choice question that's gonna, you know, basically you don't know the pathway. I think in the oral board exam, those kind of questions can still happen, but most of us that's that's something that a lot of us do not um cannot easily describe verbally now maybe you could show it on a piece of paper you you guys you, i guess you could go through it verbally i think though in the oral exam about the emphasis being more on the clinical side of it and so okay. most, most of the questions that i was asking were more related to that i think the more you know the better so because it's not that often that we'll see a case like this on the case list so mm -hmm. if you, what's going to happen is it's all the luck of the draw whether the examiner you get thinks this is something really great that they just want to grill you on, uh, you know, stereogenesis. Um, and you, you mentioned a little bit about it. So I had a feeling that you had, you know, basic understanding. Um, but the bottom line is the more you know, the better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, I'll let you out of the hot seat. Thank you. You're welcome. And let me see where we're at here. Okay, let me get another person. We should be able to get at least one more person. Just a second. Sorry, I have to get my list. Dr. Roseberry, can I come to you next? Dr. Roseberry, are you there? So the system is telling me that you are self muted. Um, so if you can unmute yourself, then we should be able to talk. I'm gonna mute you and unmute you again, just to see if that makes a difference. Dr. Roseberry, are you there? Are you there? Hello? Okay, I'm going to move on. I will uh, make note next time I'm doing the webinar, try to get you in the hot seat. I'm going to go back just to see if Dr. Pollard is still with us. Maybe, maybe her situation is fixed. Let me just... Dr. Pollard, are you there? All right, so that is obviously not working. Okay, so let me go to another person. Sorry for the delay. Dr. Beetham, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, if I go to you next? Yes. All right, I have your list here. Which list would you like me to look at? Um, let's do, can we do an OB case? Sure. Is there anything in particular or I can, I can pick? Um, you can pick, I have, I'm still reviewing this okay. case, especially the end of the list. So don't go to the end, is that what you're telling me? No, no, you can go to the end because I haven't okay. reviewed those cases. I might be a little weak there. All right, let's see here.
Sorry for the wait, just one more second. No problem. Okay, I want to ask you about case number 89. Okay. So, was this patient's um, generalized anxiety disorder related to her concern for shoulder dystocia, or is this a separate pre existing diagnosis? It was a separate pre existing diagnosis, and she had been managed um, prior to her pregnancy for these conditions with psychiatry. And how are they treating her? So I believe she was on an antidepressant. Um, it was an SSRI, fluoxetine, as well as an anxiolytic um, as needed. It was an, a benzodiazepine. And so did you recommend any modification to her treatment during pregnancy? So I co-managed this patient with um, the maternal fetal medicine specialist. and. In their um, opinion, there was nothing additional um, that needed to be done in terms of her um, medications that she was on. She was limiting her use of the, um, I believe it was lorazepam, um, so that she was using it very infrequently. Um, I think it became more an issue for her towards the end of her pregnancy. But why they did was not recommend. Of, why was it an issue for her at the end of pregnancy? I think that her anxiety was worse when she learned that the baby there was concerned for um, uh, shoulder dystocia just because of her history of a prior shoulder dystocia. And so as she got closer to her delivery time, um, I did not actually see this patient in the office, but I know that she had been, that's when she had started taking the um, benzodiazepine for anxiety so let me and ask you yeah so does lorazepam cross the placenta i would have to look that up i i'm not certain but i believe there is some some amount that does cross the placenta because i recall there was a discussion of having the pediatricians in the room um, just in case there would be any neonatal abstinence um, or respiratory depression. But because she was not taking that while she was on labor and delivery, that concern was much lower. Okay, so is um, lorazepam uh, teratogenic? Not to my knowledge. Okay, and what are some of the effects that could be seen on the neonate from a maternal benzodiazepine use in late in pregnancy? So I believe it would be if the patient was regularly using that, um, there would be then there would be concern that there would be needle, some withdrawal symptoms for the neonate. Um, if the patient were using it close to the time of delivery, um, I would believe there's a risk for respiratory depression. Um, yeah. Okay, good. So I just want to I just want to uh, take a second and just go back through this. Um, benzodiazepines are generally not recommended in pregnancy. They do cross the placenta. There is concern for teratogenic effects, which would be an early in pregnancy issue. Um, okay. However, however, the thing is, because they're not widely used in pregnancy, there's you know this is always the kind of thing where there's not as much data as we would like. But they but I think if you look this up in a drug reference, you'll find that 
that lorazepam and benzodiazepines in general are felt to be teratogenic. Um, and they are associated with certain complications, including preterm birth and growth, well, low birth weight. I, I'm not sure if pathologic growth restriction is necessarily um, the best way to say it, but definitely with low birth weight. And uh, at the time of delivery in the neonate, you can see you can see withdrawal, uh, certainly um, if a patient, that's gonna happen over days, not, not over minutes. It's not gonna be an immediate thing. Um, but more immediate things in the neonate, you could, I know um, respiratory problems, like you said, and also I think hypoglycemia is the other thing. Um, I, I think there is more information than what I know about this. Um, so I would encourage you, um, you know, they just caught my eye because I'm sure the patient would be even more anxious because of the concern <laughs> about the shoulder dystocia. Uh, and when you mentioned the benzodiazepines, immediately it was like my, you know, my ears perked up and I'm like, all oh, right, we're going to talk about this. So, I realized right after I said that, that I was like, oh, this is not where I want to be going with this question. So I yeah. should have just <laughs> left it vague and said that was managed by her psychiatrist. I mean, in that situation, should I say, I because I really don't, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was lorazepine, Pam, but I, I don't recall all the details of that because I didn't manage that. That was more her psychiatrist and the high yeah. risk doctors. Yeah, so is that so, something I need to get into? So here's the thing. I think that um, they would they will expect that if a patient is on a medication, uh, you should know whether there are any concerns about that medication in pregnancy. Um, I think that the decision um, obviously was was really being made by MFM and psychiatry. And so this is one of the situations where an exam strategy is to say, well, you know, I know the patient was on lorazepam prior to pregnancy. This is a medication that I would have concerns about. The decision for um, medical therapy during pregnancy was managed by MFM and psychiatry. And then let them ask you questions about the medication because you've stated you would have concerns about it, okay? They may ask, what concerns would you have? And then you can tell them. They're not going to, obviously, because you were not the one making the final decision, um, they're not, that's not going to be the focus of the exam. The focus of the exam is going to be what are the potential adverse effects of the medication and what would be alternatives. Um, and so, yeah, I imagine, you know, uh, the SSRI um, would be a much better choice. But for patients, this is the hard part. For patients who've been on benzodiazepine, um, it is very hard for them to not take it they it's a very addictive medication and uh used to be prescribed quite liberally but uh, the addiction potential and the tolerance with benzodiazepines is a huge huge problem so i would imagine if this patient was on it that the ssri probably feels like it does nothing for her anxiety um compared to the lorazepam so yeah i would definitely be prepared for this in case they ask you about it okay, okay. now let me ask you one other question about this case so she had a prior dis shoulder dystocia. That in and of itself is a risk factor for shoulder dystocia. Mm -hmm. what, what led to the increased concern for repeat shoulder dystocia? Was it just that knowledge or was there something else that led to the increased concern? So it was that knowledge and the um, fetus, her current fetus was, the EFW was greater than the 90th percentile. Is 3720 grams the birth weight of the baby greater than the 90th percentile? No, because she, but she was delivered at 38 weeks. Yeah, I think this is actually right below the 90th percentile. I would have to look this one up, but I think it's actually below. Um, Cause it was a, I, what, what's that? Because it, it, the overall weight at the end of the day was not over the 90th percentile, but it was the her prior yeah. testing. Yeah, yeah, with the MFM. Which brings me to this question. So I have two questions for you, and then I'll and then I'll let you be out of the hot seat. Um, what is the accuracy of an ultrasound in the third trimester for estimating fetal weight? So I think it can be um, up to twenty percent off. I would agree with that. And Plus or minus twenty percent. Okay, you were going to say mm -hmm. something else. And I think it can be even higher if the um, EFW is over forty-five hundred grams. Yes, I would agree. The bigger the baby, the greater the error, and or the bigger the estimated uh, weight, the bigger greater the error is another way to think of that too. Um, the second question is, I noticed that you did some counseling regarding um, recurrent shoulder dystocia. I'm I'm assuming 
there was some discussion about mode of delivery. What what did you guys talk about? So we we spoke with her along with MFM about the risk for a repeat shoulder dystocia given her history in combination with um, the estimated fetal weight. And we did discuss that, you know, at this time, especially at the time we were planning for delivery, it was unlikely that the fetus would be macrosomic. Um, and, you know, the chances are she would, most patients that have a history of a prior shoulder dystocia don't go on to have a, another one, but it is a risk factor. I think for the patient and her overall fertility um, planning and her goals, since she wanted a sterilization anyways, and she was so anxious, that's why she, the, it was kind of the combination of all those factors. We, we came kind of using the shared decision-making model. We came to the decision for a primary cesarean delivery. Does a cesarean delivery guarantee that the baby will not have a shoulder dystocia? Hmm. Let me ask the question differently. Does a cesarean delivery guarantee that the baby can't have a brachial plexus injury? No, it does not. Yeah, I mean, you're not going to get a, obviously, you're not going to get a shoulder dystocia between the baby's shoulder and the maternal pelvis with a cesarean section, but you can have a difficult cesarean delivery. So you can still get some of the same complications, particularly if you had a, um, a macrosomic infant and a difficult delivery. Um, so I just was listening to see if that came into the conversation because it's it's not a it's, it definitely reduces the risk, but it's not a complete guarantee that the infant can't suffer consequences related to difficult delivery. Um, okay. Um, uh, good job. I'm going to let you out of the hot seat. I was trying to think about anything else. I don't, I don't have anything else for you right now. Do you have any questions for me before I let you out of the hot seat? Um, I guess so. If so, this is a case I hadn't I haven't reviewed yet. If you know, on the exam, there's questions that are asked that, I mean, I think it was, I hope that I conveyed that I was uncertain about my answers, about, you know, the teratogenicity and effects. Yeah, but yeah but yes, you did. But I don't want you to be uncertain about that next, uh, when you get to the exam. I want, okay. again, that's one but thing, when it's on a medication in pregnancy, um, then you should, you know, look at it and know about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. gonna, if in the exam you have, talk, have something like, like if in the exam, maybe not, maybe they give me, I don't know, there's something that comes up and you aren't really sure, should you just kind of say, uh, you know, yes. okay. or, so or exam, was my head? Yeah, exam technique. If you, um, so in the exam, if they ask you and, and you absolutely have no idea, so it's a total guess, okay, I think you're much better off to say, I don't know, I'd have to look that up. Um, now, with is something teratogenic, if your patient's taking it and she's pregnant, hopefully you have a gut feeling about it. And so I would say in that case, present it the way you did. You you went, it was, you know, 50-50, yes or no. And um, unfortunately you went the wrong way with it, but but you made it clear that you, you did not uh, present it in an arrogant, overconfident way. You presented it in, a, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. And I think that is a very legitimate exam strategy. When you were asked something and you have a gut feeling, Nine times out of ten, your gut feeling is gonna gonna take you in the right direction, okay? And in this exam, if you say I don't know every time that you're just not sure, you have a feeling but you're not sure, then you'll never you'll never get to talk about anything because you'll be saying I don't know all the time because they're always gonna ask things that are you know on the fringe of where you you have some knowledge but not maybe all the knowledge. So yeah, I think what you did was fine. I would present it exactly the way you did. And you're going to win some and you're going to lose some when it's a topic that you're not 100% familiar with. Okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, good job. What I'm going to do right now, I'm just um, looking at where we're at here. I'm going to I'm going to take, if there are any questions, if you want to click the raise a hand, I'm not the raise a hand, the question mark feature. And I think, Dr. Chopra, do you have a question? Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Did you have a question? 
Yes. There was a review. There was one of the cases that we did had a history of a prior stillbirth and for like in a classical C-section. And um, like, I feel like the examiner, I thought that like a question that an examiner could ask would be like, why didn't they have a vaginal delivery? And if that didn't happen at your institution, could you just simply say that like this didn't happen at my institution or it wasn't performed under my care? Yes. Now, I think, let me make sure. So I'll rephrase the question because I'm pretty sure I understand it. You're suggesting the examiner would ask about a patient's previous delivery of a stillbirth via classical cesarean. Why didn't they have a vaginal delivery for that IUFD, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so I think it is completely, this is how I would answer that. I would, if, it, if, it, if I was not the delivering provider, which you likely would not be, I would say, in in my uh, in my practice, this would usually be a vaginal delivery. I'm not okay. sure not sure why the patient had a cesarean delivery. Now, it, one thing you can always add: I tried to get records on this, but the records weren't clear, or I did not have access to records on this, so I really couldn't figure it out. Again, that's just showing that you cared enough about you know what was going on to try to get the records. Okay. Um, yeah. But definitely what I would do is when you're asked about why something happened and you had, it's a historical thing you had nothing to do with, that's an opportunity for you to, to talk about what you would do. And that's how I would handle it. I'd say, well, I'm not, I can't speak for what happened in that particular scenario, but in my practice, this would usually be done X, Y, and Z. I think that's a really nice way to, to turn the focus from um, something that was unfortunate into something that, that can help you look uh, good because you're telling the truth about you would have done it differently. Oh, okay. okay, got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, I am going to wrap up here for tonight. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us. There will be a webinar tomorrow night, October 19th, 8.30 p.m. Structured Case Webinar. Please join us then. Have a great night. I don't anticipate any of you are taking the exam this week, but if you happen to be and you're just highly motivated and doing the webinar the night before your exam, I wish you the best of luck. Uh, and for those of you that are obviously probably most of you not taking the exam this week, uh, look forward to seeing you back uh, tomorrow. Have a great night.